Our program is going to commence. First, I want to thank all of you for coming and especially thank our panel of experts for speaking this afternoon to us. Um, each of these experts has been involved in the decommissioning of a nuclear power plant, specifically Yankee Row or Maine Yankee. And, and is, can you hear us? This, okay, these are, these are good mics and we'll speak close to them. So, okay. So each will speak for 20 minutes and after all four speak, we will open up questions to the audience and we have mics here for people to come up. We've also put on your seat three by five cards, or no, they're actually maybe four by six. And if you'd like to write down, because it's going to be 80 minutes of listening to people, write down the question that you would like to ask um, so that you would be ready when we start that. We have asked each of our speakers to address a certain set of questions, and among the four of them, we're, we're hoping that they're covered, and if not, then we will, you know, we will ask them to address them at the question and answer period. So here are the type of questions we've asked them to address. First of all, to, in a sense, give us more in-depth understanding of what the two options that you read about or hear about on radio, re read about in local newspapers that um, exist for Vermont Yankee, which will be closing down in late 2014, what options are they given in the ways that they would close down? We've heard the words decon, we've heard the words safe, st safe store. We would like those, uh, both of those options to be explained. Secondly, how safe is decommissioning? It's a long process, and that is one of the questions. How long is the process for each of these options? But also, how safe is the process? Um, and both during the decommissioning and then long term, once it is finished and the, and the site is, is closed and available for um, economic redevelopment, et cetera. So to address in terms of the security uh, questions and the safety questions rather is what is security like when these sites are being decommissioned and then when they are finished and the decommissioning is, is, uh, is approved and they no longer have a license and these sites are there for economic redevelopment, public use, how safe are they at that point? Um, residual contamination, we hear the word greenfield, that they will be cleaned to greenfield status. Greenfield is a very lofty word. It suggests kids playing soccer on the field. Is this what's meant, or is there sort of a tolerance for residual contamination? The storage of spent fuel nuclear waste rods on site. We'd like to hear all of them speak about how secure they will be, etc. The cost of decommissioning, again, in the newspaper, state of Vermont, other people, you see this estimate of like a billion dollars, and yet the fund that, uh, that Entergy has for decommissioning is somewhere around $580 million. So what happens if they, that fund is, is depleted and there is still work to do on this site? Community and public interest involvement. How do we maximize it? It looks, as I've read something about the NRC regulations, that they're public comment periods and public comment documents, but how do you maximize and optimize citizen engagement so that they are at the decision-making and negotiating table? So with, with that set of questions, and there are others, of course, we'll begin with our panel, and the first speaker is Ray Shaddis, and Ray is technical advisor for the New England Coalition on Nuclear Pollution. He was the lead public interest negotiator on the Maine Yankee decommissioning, the first large-scale reactor decommissioning to be completed in the country on time and on budget, uh, a half of what the budget being a half of what Energy claims that it needs to clean up uh, Vermont Yankee. So with that, Ray, thank you and welcome you on. <clears throat> Thank you all for turning out for this. Such a nice day to be someplace else, don't you think? The, the, um, you'll find as I speak, there's a, there's a, a pronoun uh, deficit disorder here in, in my presentation. And I fall to it, I can't help myself. When I say we, I may mean our organization in Maine, 
uh, Friends of the Coast, which was uh, the intervener, the only public advocacy organization that sort of stayed with the program after the plant announced that it was closing. Um, or, I might mean we, Friends of the Coast, myself, and the nuclear company, or it could be me and the NRC, or, so I kind of have to tune to it a little bit. Um, and I might mean we, the, the royal papal we, like, and then we said, you know, so I can't help it. It's one of those things. So if you have a question, if you go like, well, now who are you talking about? I, I, can, I can work with that. And also uh, them, them, you know. Listen carefully for the noun preceding that. It probably refers to the industry or the NRC or... All right, so here it goes. Um, we do have slide one up there. This is, this is, I'm just gonna deviate because... You have to talk I, into the mic, right? Yes, okay. I'm just, a little deviation here because I, I know that you folks probably know most of this and I'm really speaking to the, <coughs> to the choir here, but um, the, uh, the New Yorker had a magnificent cartoon uh, of, and it showed like Red Square, you know, Red Square by the Kremlin, and there were a zillion people out there, and then way, way, way in the distance there was this podium and this couple of little fat guys up, up at the podium in the microphone, and somebody in the crowd was saying, Oh no, not another PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> this is mine. So <clears throat> this is, this is, if everything goes according to plan, this is Vermont Yankees' last year of operation and it's its most dangerous year of operation. Um, and we'll be going into decommissioning um, in 2015. And um, whether that's safe store or decon prompt decommissioning, um, and there are reasons you should care about that. Um, let me have the next slide, please. A nuclear accident is more of a risk today and through 2014 than at any time in the reactor's 41 years of operation. We had good reason to be concerned, um, as has been demonstrated by Fukushima. Same reactor, same type. Um, if you, if you went inside, you couldn't tell them apart except for some Japanese writing in, inside the Fukushima plant. And um, it is of an age where tender loving care is needed in order to operate it, but employee morale is at an all-time low, uh, and so is their focused attention. Uh, the best and the brightest uh, of Vermont Yankee personnel are leaving in droves. Um, the demand for workers in the nuclear industry is quite high. The pay is good elsewhere. Um, in 2011, <clears throat> when we were five years into uh, a legal intervention before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on Vermont Yankees license, uh, their lawyers wrote that they were having, because of this legal holdup, drat that New England coalition. They wrote that um, they were having a hard time retaining employees or attracting new employees because of the uncertainties. Well, the negative side of that has come to bear. Uh, the plant is closing. Employees know it. They're not sure what their um, retirement packages are going to look like. Uh, Maine Yankee put together some very nice ones for their employees, but we're not sure what Entergy is going to do here. Um, so the folks that are at the plant 
I don't know how many of them are busy reading the want ads instead of the gauges and dials, but um, they are distracted. So it's very dangerous from a human performance point of view. The regulators, uh, primarily the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and it'll be the NRC from here forward, um, the NRC um, is a reluctant regulator at best. Um, if they can give the company a hint and get them to do the right thing, uh, they much prefer to do that than to tell them what to do. If the company is uh, performing poorly, if they're uh, engaged in dangerous practices or working with dangerous equipment, the NRC um, staffers are very reluctant um, to make an issue of it because their um, superiors are quite likely uh, to side with the company over their staffers. So um, there are commitments, and there are new rules regarding um, <clears throat> modifications to be made after Fukushima, safety-related work. There's safety-related work that the company committed to when they got their renewed license from NRC, when they got permission to do what's called the power-up rate, where they're running uh, the plant with 120% uh, more heat than it uh, had in its original license. NRC uh, is doing hands-off. Uh, we don't know what the company is doing. Uh, we don't know if they're following through on plans that they had in place to do safety-related repairs. I suspect not, because what for? We're only going to run one here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, equipment does not stop aging just because there remains only one year to run. This photograph is something that was pilfered by my friend Paul Blanche here from the NRC, but it shows um, electrical cables, um, and many of these are safety-related electrical cables that are run underground at these plants. And this particular uh, vault, cable vault, where they they come out of the conduit. You can see the condition of these cables going. It, it, what's hard to see on that slide is that uh, a third of the way down the page, the cables start running underwater. These are cables that were never designed to be submerged. And most of our nuclear plants feature cables that were never designed to be submerged running underwater. And Paul and I raised this issue um, over two years ago. Uh, because that was what was found at Vermont Yankee. Uh, that um, cable vaults and, and manholes were flooded, um, and these uh, cables were uh, not rated for that kind of service. Uh, if they are called upon in an emergency um, and there is a surge of electricity through them, then you, you risk a short circuit, which would wipe out your circuitry. This is the flooded cables, the flooded electrical components, were one of the main features of uh, the inability to recover the Fukushima accident. So we have that sitting at, at, at Vermont Yankee. It's a very dangerous year, and um, we are committed to making certain that we keep Vermont Yankee, Entergy Vermont Yankee's nose, and the NRC's nose right to the grindstone right to the very end um, because it, it doesn't get any better and your chances don't get any better as you go through next August, September, October, November. Um, in fact, they get worse. Uh, next slide, please. Whoops. Let me go back there. Yeah. Um, the largest risk in terms of consequences at, at Vermont Yankee is it as, as it has been for the last 30 or 40 years, um, the spent fuel pool. Um, the, it, it, it's uncertain at this point if the hydrogen explosions at um, Fukushima happened um, in the uh, levels below the spent fuel pool or on the same level um, as the spent fuel pool. But 
Those of you that uh, saw that spectacular footage on TV with the uh, explosion in clouds uh, rising several hundred feet in the air above the plant um, know that this is a vulnerable uh, installation, 70 or 80 feet off the ground, and um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> this particular risk may or may not go away three to five years after the plant is shut down. Um, if there is a um, earnest campaign uh, immediately upon shutdown to move the irradiated fuel, the spent fuel, from that elevated storage tank and put it into uh, dry casks. Next slide, please. Um, then that risk is is removed. The particular cask that uh, Entergy purchased for Vermont Yankee um, is a um, it's a good design, and it features a thermal siphon in the center of it, so that fuel that is um, typically hotter than that which um, is normally put in the cask. In other words, it can take fuel probably uh, more recently taken from the reactor than five years. Maybe it can be reduced to three. And um, so that the campaign to take the couple thousand uh, fuel assemblies out of that pool and pack them in the casks um, needs to be done right away. We don't know what the company intends to do. It looks like they want to drag it out for forever. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is about to issue a waste confidence rule um, sometime early in the coming year. Right now their position is that um, the spent fuel pools and the dry casks are equally safe. Um, if, if there were a um, drain down of the spent fuel pool um, and the fuel were to be uh, cladding, the fuel cladding were to begin to oxidize, uh, it's uh, essentially an unquenchable uh, fire. Not big flames, but like your, your charcoal grill. Um, but we're talking hundreds of, and hundreds of tons of material. Um, the NRC has done studies. There's one called the um, NUREG 1738. It's the spent fuel pool accident risk at decommissioning nuclear power stations. I'm glad to say I was part of putting that report together uh, with NRC. It was written because of risks that were taken at Maine Yankee, and uh, which we reported to the NRC. And Ray, I think we have about one more minute. One minute, really? Okay, fine. Oh, how? Uh, what is it? Is five. Okay, so five five minutes. Sorry about that. Oh, cool. No, that's mm -hmm. good. Because so what I'll do is, is I'll leave the uh, the decommissioning part of this to the question and answer period, and then we mm -hmm. can we we'll see where we go with that. Um, so that report says a couple of really interesting things. One, it says that the the um, structure of the containment of Vermont Yankee would represent uh, no serious obstacle to aircraft penetration. Number two, NRC's seismic expert said that in the event of a serious earthquake, and I would throw in a, a bomb wave with that, um, the pool could tear from corner to corner, mm -hmm. or in an extreme case, the bottom of it could drop out. This is their words. This is NRC. The, if something like that happened, if that pool were to collapse, the fuel would not only be exposed to the air to begin to heat up rather quickly, um, but there would be no shielding for it, which would mean that you really couldn't approach the site. 
You know, the fire trucks came in at Fukushima and they sprayed water into the spent fuel pools, but they had umpteen feet of concrete between them and the fuel, um, plus some distance, plus they were getting water in there mm -hmm. uh, to add to the shielding. Crushed fuel under a building, um, even if you were to drop one of these concrete casks when you were trying to, to fill it, um, which would punch a hole in the bottom of the spent fuel pool, um, there would be no approaching it, no cure. Um, next slide, please. What do we have? One up there, don't try this at home? No, no. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, fine, I've, I've covered that. That particular um, collection there, that's at Connecticut Yankee. Uh, the uh, spent fuel storage area at Vermont Yankee, I mean at Maine Yankee, looks very much like that, except that we were able to get the company to divide the concrete uh, pad up into modules so that you get a truck in or uh, heavy handling equipment and access any, um, any cask at any time without having to move any. And this is important because it takes days, literally days, to lift these things and move them. So if you have a leak, if you have some kind of accident, you have a terrorist event uh, and you want to get to them, um, you can get in there at Maine Yankee and get them. You can't at Connecticut Yankee by the looks of it. Um, it's an issue we want to raise with um, Vermont Yankee. This gives you, next slide please, this just gives you a sp uh, sense of scale on the casks. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's a full one or not, um, but, but we have walked in among the casks and, and uh, stroked their lovely concrete sides. They're, they're 20 feet tall, they're 11 to uh, uh, 12 feet in diameter, um, and you're looking at uh, either very heavily reinforced concrete with a, with a 5 8 inch steel liner in that, in that uh, concrete silo, or in the case of, of Maine Yankee, what they want to do is they want to pour non-reinforced concrete into a big cookie canister steel arrangement with uh, like one inch thick steel inside and out. They're rugged. Um, there's no way that we can think of that an accident with one cask can propagate to the next cask. Mm -hmm. The entire mass of fuel can become involved in an accident. Um, I'm going to end with that because, because I think, oh, no I'm not. <gasps> Sorry. Next slide, please. I, <clears throat> do we have a uh, chart up? Okay. NOAA. Yes, NOAA. National Oceanic Atmospheric uh, whatever. Are they aeronautic and atmospheric? I don't know. NOAA. You all heard of NOAA. They do the big time weather. Every day NOAA produces <clears throat> a um, radiation dispersion map, um, in fact every hour, for every nuclear plant in the country, um, showing uh, on a hypothetical release where it would go. The, this is Vermont Yankee on a, on a given day. Um, and then, next slide please. And this is Vermont Yankee on another day. That plume is, uh, the heavy radiation doses are swamping Boston in that one. Wow. I, think, I think if you're not involved now, you might look at this and think, Maybe this is a good reason to get involved, to get the information, um, and, uh, and participate in this cleanup. Right, That's thank it. you. It's an excellent uh, way to finish. And, and that is uh, an intention of holding this panel, is for people to both get informed and also at the end we'll discuss how to get involved. I have one brief question for you before we move on. And that is, uh, you. you you made the point that the biggest risk that exists now and also when the plant is shut down and decommissioning starts is the, um, the fuel pool of uh, rods. Now, is, no matter what option Vermont Yankee chooses, quick decommissioning or longer term, is it possible 
yourself having been the lead public negotiator for Maine Yankee, is it possible to, uh, to get the company to deal with those rods first uh, as, as decommissioning begins, whether it's safe store or whether it's decon? Well, right now the company is before the uh, Vermont Public Service Board. So they're, they're engaged in a hearing. We're interveners in the hearing. There is a coercive element to that where if they want to uh, come through the hearing with a, with a positive result, then they, wanna, they need to talk to us about what our concerns are. Mm -hmm. And that, it's also true of the state. State of Vermont is currently in hot negotiations, if you don't mind, with, uh, with Entergy on this very issue. Okay. Um, the next opportunity that comes up for that kind of uh, pressure is when they uh, issue their license termination plan, that's not required until two years before they finish decommissioning. So that could be 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know of any other place where, where they can be brought in, where people are under oath, where uh, evidence and such applies. And, and I just want to make one correction. <coughs> what I intended to say, if I didn't say it, was that this, the spent fuel pool accident has the potential for the greatest consequences of any accident that might happen at the plant. And that's because um, a meltdown would involve p potentially a full core uh, of the reactor. The spent fuel pool has more than five full cores in it. So the amount of radioactive material that could be dispersed is much that greater. much greater. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Dr. John Mullen. He's a professor of landscape architecture and regional planning at UMass Amherst. And his areas of uh, research interest have been focused on industrial revitalization and economic redevelopment. Uh, I just want to make a comment that I've, I've heard, and he also affirmed it, that a, a paper he co-authored called The Closing of the Yankee Row Nuclear Power Plant, this was written some years ago, has been more widely read than the more than 100, and this is all together, I presume, 100 chapters, articles, conference proceedings, and technical reports. And, and the numbers of readers are only going up. You almost got it. <laughs> what happened is for 20 years, it was, uh, I wrote this paper 20 years ago, and uh, what I, I took a look at what happened as, as the plant was closing and what it meant to the, to the community, and um, it was written in the Journal of the American Planning Association, which is the best journal in my field, and it had good readership, but then Berkeley came out with this means now that scholars can, professors can now track how often their papers are being downloaded. And for the last three years, I can track how much every single one of my papers is being downloaded and hopefully read. Well, all of a sudden, out of the blue came Yankee Row, which was close to the bottom, right, because I had written it so long ago, and it started cl climbing and climbing. In the last several times, uh, it has been my, the number one, number one read. And I think what it suggests more than anything else is that this is an issue that, that is, is of concern. And I think it, it would across would, the country. Across the country. And I, I want to get into this a bit. So um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, and I hope that we, we can get something of benefit out of it. Now, 104 nukes across the United States. Many of these are going to be closing in five years, in 10. All of them are going to have an end state. And that end state is not planned. What happens, there's, there's, there, there is no real end. The NRC stance is to come and create a safe environment. A safe environment is, is perceived as very, very narrowly. And what happens is that there are people who live there, there's been investments that have been made, and, that, and it has an enormous impact. And this is what we found, what we found in, in, in Roe, and I'll talk about that later. The key element, the message that I would like to, to, to give today is very important that we link in with something at the federal level with something like the OEA, the Office of Economic Adjustment. The Office of Economic Adjustment it has the responsibility of going in and helping every base closing, military base closing across the United States. So if a base like Chicopee closes, or Westover, they will come in and provide the assistance uh, to help that community to right-size itself 
in one way or another, and to make sure that conditions are safe. We don't have that with, with, with the NRC. We have nothing in place. We have no real federal interest in terms of, of doing anything. And it's not simply, it's not simply looking at, at Vernon or southern Vermont or North, Northampton, the, or the three corners, um, that indeed there is nothing out there formally in any government program that's designed for the long-term assistance to communities um, in, in, in right-sizing themselves. Now, that's something that we are very interested in in our, in our shop at the university. And we're beginning to look at policies and, regular, and, and, and means of, at the federal level that assistance can come. And that in much like there's going to be another black round, that's the, the, the acronym for base closings, um, that there will be more base closings company. We would very much like to link the two programs in terms of providing the assistance to communities that they need in coming out. So that, and that one is, 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 is the number one issue that we have, and it is something that has stayed with us. There are 17 base closings that occurred in, 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 uh, in New England since, since the end of World War II. Overwhelmingly, all of them have got extensive assistance from the feds. And that's, that's something that, that we need to pick up on. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, coming back to Yankee Row and what happened. To me and, our, and to the team that looked at it, it was death by a thousand cuts. It was, it was indeed, just like we heard here a few minutes ago, no sooner does the announcement occur than change, both psychological change and economic change occurs almost immediately. The best and the brightest do leave. The, nu the nuclear engineer has many options. And indeed, but does that nuclear engineer want to leave? That's a different story. But indeed, if he or she is going to have a quality of life that matches what they have now, then, then it probably is going to happen. The second group is that group that cannot leave, and cannot leave for a couple of reasons. One, if you're a 55-year-old worker, you're invested, your kids are in, is finishing high school or in college, um, and, and, and you, they've all invested in community. What is the psychological factor of you having to give up your roots? What is the psychological factor? So right off the bat, what you find, those, those who stay, the good part of those who do stay is they become entrepreneurs of necessity. Entrepreneurs of necessity. And this is, this is something, they don't want to be there, but they've got skill sets. And that is something that we need if, if indeed we, we have to take advantage of. But overwhelmingly, they will leave. Another critical fact that will occur is the value of a house, the value of the property. Virtually all of them will be underwater very quickly. And indeed, there will be very little climate for reinvestment. The absence of a climate of reinvestment means, in effect, that you're going to allow your house to slowly decay, and you won't go down to the local Aubuchon to buy your, your paint. And so the twin tandem, the tandem of disinvestment coupled with lock, loss of local purchasing means that that merchant, that is a thousand cuts, that merchant loses that sale and begins to lose, begins to lose market share. So we see, we see that occurring. Now there is in terms of social capital. In social capital, one of the things about these engineers, and people have a stereotype about engineers um, you know, being scientifically cold, it's not true. They are, they are wonderful people in terms of participation in community. They're wonderful. They're at your scouts. And they're, they're at your sporting events. They're out there in, in civic groups. And the thing of it is, and they're learned people. They start to withdraw. Now they start to withdraw. And you begin to see that less participation is occurring, less sense of a community. And this sounds almost like academic claptrap. It isn't. Because what is, is community is both qualitative and quantitative. And on the qualitative side, indeed, it is a social capital thing that begins to lead to the change of what that place was. And so we saw, we saw, that, we saw that happening. Another critical happening is this. What happens in terms of things medical? One of the things about a, 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 a nuclear power company is they have wonderful medical plants. And indeed, particularly if you look at people as they're staying there and retiring, those plans, what happens to them? Vermont already has a tough problem in terms of, of getting medical plans for folks. And indeed, when, when these go, it's another factor. You postpone the visit to the doctor. You postpone that piece of sur that, that, that little surgery that you, that's been nagging you. And indeed, you find that this, that, that this occurs. 
So we see that, we see that occurring. Now, um, finally, in terms of this sense of place that we see, is if I say, if I say Vermont Row, and they have recovered quite nicely in a, in a strange way, um, and, and we'll hear our, our other speakers speak to this. But the fact is, is that you're at the, where fits boosterism, where fits a sense of the future, where serves a sense of commitment to that community. If I'm going to have a nuclear graveyard in the center of my community for the rest of my life, what positive part of life am I going to be putting forth? And, and, and we haven't looked at this much, and we put an awful lot of burden on the people of Vernon, awful lot of, ver uh, of, of burden on the people of the, of the three corners, which we are part of, awful lot of burden on part of, 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 the, of the state of Vermont. The fact of the matter is, is that this is bigger than all of us. It's an example of something that's coming. And it's not just going to be these 100 nukes. It's going to happen again in, nuke, in, 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 in military plants, not to mention the closing of all these coal plants. And there is a series of these locally unwanted land uses, the acronym LULU, locally unwanted land uses, that are now that are the result of federal actions that, and that now mean that the federal government has to step up. So we can, rather than holding, holding, tea, holding coffee cake parties, there is something that is time for us, if we're going to take some kind of political action, from my standpoint, it's time really to put the responsibility where it belongs. It was the Adams for Peace, it was the Adams for Peace plan that in effect presented us to us. We all bought into it. I bought my first stamp as a kid. It showed, a new, I think it was, do you remember the stamp? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a stamp that had a nuclear power plant. My dad told me, John, we won't have coal in the cellar anymore. And I thought that was pretty cool, right? But that, that was the message. That was the message, and we embraced it. And with the message also comes, I'll, and I'll stop where I began, is, is the need to have an end state, and we don't know what that is. And I think it's time for us to go to work on it. At, we're hoping at the university, we're, we're trying to raise some funds now and get a team together to take a, develop a conference on, the, on, on what policies the federal government should, should undertake uh, for communities that are going to go through, through, uh, uh, through closing. And that's one of the things that, that we have this interest, and I think that's probably one of the reasons I got picked up on this panel. So with that, I'll close. And, it's, 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 and by the way, being a planner means it's always like Bolero. You never stop. You build, and you build, and you build. And it's not going to be, it's not going to be this year. Some of you are thinking of the movie 10, I can tell. Um, but, uh, um, but you're going to build and build and build. And, that, uh, and then, then hopefully that uh, we can stop this nonsense. Thank you. OK, thank you, John. And you actually um, left some time, and I have a question for okay. you. First of all, um, it's clear you're, you're calling that this is a national problem, and it's also across industries. Um, and you're calling in the case of nuclear uh, power industry for counterpart to what the military have with the closure of bases. Where in Washington do you see pressure points, um, which, which uh, Markey probably, but you know, which committees and also are there other interest groups, public yes. interest groups, et cetera? Yeah. I, I would begin, and I think the state of Vermont is doing this already, but I, it's, it is a starting point, is to go to the Economic Development Administration, and there you pick up money that I think they're still calling it sudden and severe money, in which a community is going through a transition, and it has a, and it has a uh, one single large industry in it, um, and that would, begin, that would begin the process. And that's what we call plan for plan money and you plan for planning first. The second would be to, to, to begin to, to have, develop discussions with OEA, the Office of Economic uh, Adjustment, in terms of how it could broad, broaden its mandate mm -hmm. to begin to include nuclear power plants and others of similar ilk. And I pick up on these, clo these, these coal plants, which have significant amounts of environmental impacts as well. Um, and, and, and to have a comprehensive plan in place um, to, to, to look at those. And the time is getting, is, is pretty, is, is pretty, it's, this is a good time to do it because I'm, as, as I watch this, there's going to be another, I will, I will predict there'll be another BRAC closing, base closing 
in, um, across the nation in the next year or so. And that if, we, if there's a means to link these, this is probably a good time to do it. And I would also expect that, that these base closings are going to hit us. I mean, Massachusetts, I think you'll see it with Hanscom. And I think you'll see it probably in New London or Portsmouth. But the fact is, is that putting these together um, means, in effect, is that one organization is a face in Washington, one funding source, and then, and then to go off and, and, and take a look at it. Thank you. And one other quick question. You mentioned that um, you mentioned Roe as a place where there has been some unique uh, sort of p coming back. Uh, right. In New England, we had three plants that have closed and finished decommissioning, and all uh, all have been active on those. Are there any that you would point to to say that, despite not having federal support, um, that they have they have going beyond just being a, a closed site and some economic development going on at these places or some potential for yeah. it? Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful question, and, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm, I'm going to waffle in a way, mm -hmm. um, that, that the communities have come back, but not as they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. The communities came back not in terms of what they invested in, uh, to, to be. And some communities have, and I think when we look at Roe, um, that you'll see, you'll, you'll see this happening. I don't think that Roe ever anticipated um, last year not being able to plow. Um, I don't know if Roe's, you know, what the scores are and MCAS scores and, or if they've gone down. But I, the story of the thousand cuts that I'm talking about, um, and yet Roe is a beautiful town. And there are people there, and there are people, there, I'll call them Franklin County types, um, that are you, that, who are hardy and, and, and skillful and street smart in a, in, in a, in a certain way. Who, and they're much like Vermonters in the sense that it takes three jobs to make a life and, and, and to cobble those together. And so it happens, but is this the life that you intended. Mm -hmm. And and the, the final thing, in, in New England particularly, we see this far more than, than in any other parts of the US, this concept of topophilia. Topophilia means love of place. Uh -huh. it, is, it is somehow we get committed into, this, in, into, into the soil here. That's and true. if hard times come, we do our darndest to try and stay. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Our, our third. <laughs> And we'll applaud at the end for all of them as well. Yeah. Our, our third speaker is Paul Blanche. He's a nuclear engineer and a nuclear whistleblower who participated in Maine uh, Yankee decommissioning. He's an expert witness on licensing. And he has been known to say, and this is in quotes, it's money over safety for the nuclear industry and the NRC. Paul, thank you for a um, couple pieces of uh, recent news, the Patriots are down 6 nothing at halftime. <laughs> but they're always down at halftime, we know that. <laughs> but, Thank you uh, for coming despite missing, <laughs> choosing this over that. But I, but I think more importantly, Ray just mentioned that the NRC's position has always been that um, dry cask storage is just as safe, or, or the storage of fuel and spent fuel is just as safe as dry cask. I picked up on the news where the chairman of the NRC was in Japan the other day, and she made a statement that might change all that. She made a statement that dry cask is actually safer than storage in the spent fuel pool. Uh, her background certainly leans her to that position, but for her to publicly state it, I think might have some long-ranging impacts um, and certainly I think anyone with any nuclear background certainly believes that the storage of spent fuel and dry cask is much much safer than the storage in um, spent fuel pools. The danger of terrorism is reduced, the danger from earthquakes and other natural disasters as we've seen in Japan is, is reduced and there's no doubt in anyone's any engineer's mind that the storage of fuel and dry cask is significantly safer than the storage of five cores or ten cores 
in a spent fuel pool whose dry out could cause the uh, spread of very, very highly radioactive material due to zirconium fires uh, out literally hundreds of miles, and that's what they're dealing with in Japan. Um, both John and Ray alluded to a, a, a topic that I want to briefly cover that really I don't think anyone's ever covered uh, before for a nuclear power plant that's about to be uh, decommissioned. Ray briefly mentioned that uh, operators are, well, if I'm a 45-year-old operator and I know my plant's shutting down, yes, I'm going to be not watching the control board, I'm going to be out looking for a job. That not only pertains to the operators, it pertains to management, it pertains to the maintenance technicians and everyone else inside the plant. But I think even more significant than that aspect of the personnel that are associated with the plant looking for new jobs and about, about to leave is the, the maintenance status, not only uh, from the actual plant that's been running for 41 years at 100, and 100 plus percent power. So the plant is getting old and I'm getting old too. Um, my eyesight's failing, I told Pat, my hearing is down, my batteries are down. Everything is aging, everything requires maintenance. Um, and when you have an agency that supposedly regulates this nuclear industry called the NRC, which uh, really does not regulate the industry, except they are an advocate of the industry, and they will allow nuclear power plants to do anything the nuclear power plants have requested. If a nuclear power plant wants to violate a regulation, the licensee, be it Vermont Yankee or Pacific Gas and Electric, simply asks the NRC and they've never denied a exemption from a regulation. But more importantly is not those things that are, are safety, well, the safety-related things certainly are uh, very, very important, but there are non-safety items. And if we look at the accidents uh, that have occurred in the United States, be it Three Mile Island, be it davis Bessie, be it other events or near misses in the United States, these were usually initiated by systems that are really not safety-related, that weren't being operated properly or weren't being maintained properly. And I, and I think that between now and a year from now, I, I think the citizens of that reside in the area of Vermont Yankee should ask the NRC to address it. Not that they will, but to go on record to address it. If I have a car that's 41 years old, and I know that that car is going to be condemned or sent to the junkyard, in a year, and uh, I see its tires, well, they're starting to wear out. Well, if that car's going to operate for 10 years, I'm going to replace the tires. But if that car's going to be retired, sent to the junkyard next year, I'm not going to replace the tires. Am I going to change the oil? No, I'm not going to do it because that car's going to be junked. Am I going to replace the brake lines, inspect the brake lines? No. This is the same attitude that the management of Entergy, whose ultimate objective is the bottom line, and that's keep costs down. And right now, I'm sure if someone were able to get into the backlog of work orders at uh, Vermont Yankee, you would, like when I was at Millstone, we had 3,000 work orders that were not closed or were deferred. And these are usually maintenance items that, well, we haven't got time to do it during this refuelage outage. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. And right now, the situation in Vermont Yankee, and I think this is somewhat human nature, is that that maintenance and the, and the philosophy of management is that these plants are safe and nothing will never ever, ever happen to them no matter what. Uh, we know that not to be true. But Entergy is not going to spend the money to maintain these plants. And I think that the danger of these plants, of Vermont Yankee at least, uh, is not only inherently there, but it's going to continuous, continually increase 
for the next 12 months as that maintenance is not done, it's deferred, and certainly the NRC is not going to impose any additional requirements or even their normal requirements on maintaining that plant, whether it be operational qualification or maintenance of valves or uh, fuel leakage, it doesn't matter, transformers, uh, cooling towers, whatever else has happened uh, at Vermont Yankee. The other analogy, and, and I hope none of you have ever faced it, would be is if you got into some economic situation and your house is about to be repossessed. And as John alluded to, are you going to uh, go to the local Home Depot or Obershans or whatever else has to be around here to repaint that house and maintain that house? Absolutely not. You're going to let that house, and I, uh, again, human nature uh, says, I'm not going to spend something, some money on something that uh, I'm not going to have a year from now. And that's exactly what I think is going to happen with Vermont Yankee. Uh, it had, fortunately did not have, we didn't have a situation of Maine Yankee because I think, right, correct me if I'm wrong, Maine Yankee was shut down when they announced they were going to decommission it, correct? Yeah, it was. Well, well the, decision, the decision not to try to operate it and go to decommission all in one day. Yeah. yeah, okay, so with Maine Yankee, I'm not sure of the situation with Yankee Row, but I know the situation with Connecticut Yankee was down uh, when they made the decision. So they didn't face this very unique problem that Vermont Yankee has. No reactor has. Pardon? But, <laughs> but I'm not sure anything can be done about it. Uh, what I'd like to encourage people who are inclined to do so is to uh, write a letter and point out what Ray and what I point out and what John and Deb have pointed out is, you know, this is a first time, very unique, very, very serious situation that, and I'm not sure what can be done by it because the NRC won't do it, the state of Vermont, the state nuclear engineer won't do it, and uh, they probably don't even have the the power to do it, but it's a problem that somewhat bothers me, and it's a problem that has never come up before. I thought this might be an appropriate topic to bring up, a topic that I've never ever brought up before, that there is extreme danger of operating Vermont Yankee at 120% power for the next 12 months. And if any citizen or official who happens to be out here and yeah it's true I live 90 miles downstream of Vermont Yankee and won't be affected as much as many of you will be I think that one ought to consider writing to your state senators uh, again we're in Massachusetts and one of the best senators going as far as nuclear is, is Markey uh, I haven't approached Markey's office on this particular topic because I have a new grandkid that's taken up 99% of my time, and I just haven't got the time, haven't had the time, or taken the time to do so. But I think it's a very, very important aspect that extra care, and this plant is aging just like I am and Ray is, Ray more so than me, but, uh, but not me. But not John, <laughs> none of us, it's just, just me and Ray, uh, that it's a critical time. And they're going to push the daylights out of this thing. We've got defective cooling towers, transformers, condensers. We've got maintenance that hasn't been done. Even if someone demanded that the federal government identify all those maintenance items that have been deferred, and when they look at the significance of a deferred maintenance, they say, well, the chance of that one thing failing is very low. It's uh, one in a million or one in 10,000. But when you take 10,000 of those maintenance items that have been deferred, um, the, the risk to the general public is uh, increasing every day, I believe, for, for a number of, of reasons, and that is the 
lack of maintenance and the uh, uh, lack of trained personnel that will be operating these plants and the NRC that is going to fight tooth and nail to keep this plant going until 2014. I know it's a new subject. I think it's a very important subject. It's not a subject that I'm planning to uh, personally address. Um, it's, I'm lazy. I'm old. I'm tired. <laughs> But I, I think it's something that everyone should be aware of and um, should give due consideration to and uh, somehow get to your state legislators, your federal senators, congressmen, uh, right into the NRC is a waste of uh, computer time as far as I'm concerned. Um, but think about it. If you agree with me, maybe you don't agree with me, maybe I'm way off base. Uh, but I think it's a real problem, and I know I haven't taken my 10, 15, 20 minutes, and uh, I would love the opportunity to respond to questions, and obviously I've got other areas of expertise uh, other mm -hmm. than uh, uh, maintenance or deferred maintenance of nuclear power plants. So thanks very much, Pat, and thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, Paul. And you've left some time. I mean, you didn't speak your 20 minutes, so there will be more time for questions at the end. But one question to this issue that you raise in terms of this last year being a very high-risk one. Um, is there, and this could be for any, any of you, uh, does the Certificate for Public Good which has not yet been issued by the, is it the, uh, the uh, Public Service Commission, it's called? Board, Public board. Service Board. Board. Is there any opportunity in that to address what you are talking about in terms of requiring vigilant sort of maintenance um, during this last year? And Deb, you're shaking your head yeah, now. Ray is much more familiar okay. with the operation of the Public Service Board and what their charter is, and I'm going to let Ray respond yeah. to that. There you go. How's that for passing the buck? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, New England Coalition is an intervener. Excuse me. New England Coalition is an intervener before the Public Service Board on the question of uh, license renewal or extended operation. And um, we've pretty much gone through the process. Um, uh, final briefs are in, uh, the arguments were made. We did raise the, the issues when Vermont Yankee announced that they would be closing in a year. We said, what about, what about the workers, you know? And um, the Public Service Board is limited by federal preemption from dealing with most operational issues. If we can tie it to reliability, um, you know, we may have a shot. Um, if we can tie it to other issues, land use issues and so on, we may have a shot. But, but basically, um, the Public Service Board becomes a forum for these kinds of issues. And as much as we can get the press to pay attention, as much as we can get the political people to pay attention, um, then there can be some pressure put upon NRC. and, and uh, it, it, well, this is a point where I may differ with Paul a little bit, but, but my experience with NRC is when, when they are publicly embarrassed over their poor performance, they will then turn on the licensee. You know, it's your fault that we didn't find anything. And then they will make the licensee perform. And I think that, that, that actually forms part of the background for the closing of uh, the other three nuclear stations in the in the state, mm -hmm. I mean in the in New England. Yep. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to our final speaker, Deb Katz. Uh, she is, and anyone in Franklin County at least knows a tenacious, well-respected director of the Citizens Awareness Network, uh, also known as CAN. CAN is a nonprofit grassroots organization. It's based in New England as well as New York. And CAN has played an instrumental role in reducing New England's use of nuclear power by 33%. Uh, before Deb speaks, I would just like to mention as well, I noticed on the table there with, with materials, a book that she has written 
It's called In the Valley of the Shadow, a manual for those left behind. She's also trained as a social worker and works as a social worker. And this book is written from her own experience of um, grief after loss and something that she says is not well understood. So, um, so with that, Deb. <laughs> so with that, great, you all crazy, right? <laughs> so let's try not to do that. But, um, well, decommissioning demonstrates the colossal failure of nuclear power, you know. And um, after shutting Yankee Road down and being involved in that, our, our local group, and at that point we were a local group, really called for the immediate cleanup of um, the and decommissioning of Yankee Atomics, the Yankee Row Reactor. I live four miles from the Yankee Row Reactor and 16 miles from Vermont Yankee. So my concerns were really real and immediate in this. And I, I want to preface this in a certain way by why CAN does what it does. Uh, because we're not, I, we're not ideologues and we're not fanatics. We suffer from um, an epidemic of disease in our community that we believe has been caused by the routine and regular releases of radiation from the Yankee Row reactor. We have statistical significance in breast cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, multiple myeloma, as well as children with Down syndrome. We have one of the highest rates of learning disabled children in the state, and Massachusetts has had the highest rate of learning disabled children in the country. We have one of the highest rates of handicapped children in the state. And so these issues are real and immediate. My husband used to say, we pay our electric bills at our medical centers. Mm. So the notion of dealing with wanting Yankee Row closed and wanting the waste out and having it happen immediately comes from a very visceral place. And we came to regret it. We came to regret that stance, which although based on fear and is understandable, wasn't necessarily what was best for our community. So what you need to understand are nuclear reactors are really toxic waste dumps, you know even though they look so groovy when they're operating. Suddenly they close and they've become a dump. Well, they've really been a dump all along, except there's a lot of propaganda to make it look very groovy. So to give you a sense of part of the colossal failure, this is just in terms of finances for Roe. Yankee Roe cost $39 million to build about, this is in 1961, and it cost over $700 million to clean up. Mm. That's a colossal failure. And why did it cost 700 million? Well, it started at 265 million, then it went back to what was like the Public Service Board, but in Massachusetts, and said, hey, we need 325. We underestimated. Following year, we need 500. It just kept going up. And it went up. Why? Because as they did the site surveying, as they began to clean up the site, what they found were plumes of contamination which went down into the groundwater. At Yankee Row, there was tritium contamination that went down over 300 feet. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about cleanup, we're talking about a real mess. And what you also have to understand is Yankee Row will never be released for unrestricted use. Do you think it's because of the radiation? PCB contamination. So these are really toxic sites. And so the issue of how they get cleaned up is, is a very important issue. And we were involved in the cleanup, the closure and cleanup of Connecticut Yankee as well. And what you had was a similar situation unfolding at Connecticut Yankee. In both situations, we spent a lot of time just trying to catch up with what was going on. But in both cases, both Yankee Row and Connecticut Yankee, their decommissioning fund was completely underfunded. But with both of them, they were basically utilities. So they, the states weren't deregulated, and they had a public service board or something as analogous to it to go back to. So they could continue, and they continue to go today. Yankee Atomic is still getting 
$5 million a year from the rate base to pay for babysitting the high-level waste at Yankee Row. Oh, We're yeah. paying for that. At Connecticut Yankee, Connecticut Light and Power is going to pay, their rate base is going to pay through 2015 for the cleanup of Connecticut Yankee, even though they haven't necessarily benefited from any of that power. What makes Vermont Yankee a far more complicated and dangerous situation is it's called what is called as a merchant plant, which means that it is a private corporation and it sells its power on the open market. It has no rate base to go back to. So there's no public service board. There's nobody to say, hey, we need a rate increase. And in fact, part of the deal when it bought, Entergy bought Vermont Yankee, was that it wasn't going to have to contribute to the decommissioning fund. So you have an underfunded decommissioning fund at Vermont Yankee without a rate base to go back to and a question of how they're going to make it happen. And you've got to understand that Entergy is a sinking ship financially. So the whole context, they've been talking about the issues. They're not going to watch safety and what's going on, and all of that is real. But it also needs to be put in the context that Entergy is financially very vulnerable. We put in, CAN and other groups put in a 2.206 petition to the NRC about Entergy's financial vulnerability and how that could affect safety at Vermont Yankee. Fitzpatrick and the Pilgrim reactor. And in fact, the Attorney General of New York came out Wednesday in support of our petition saying that he wants the NRC to open, get the records opened on Entergy's financial qualifications at all these nukes. And what has the NRC done in terms of this? They told their staff that they can't, after meeting with Entergy, they told their staff that they could not have access to the records for any of Entergy's financial qualifications or any other nuclear reactor. So you have this nuke, you have it underfunded, you have it having to cut back potentially on maintenance, on safety, both in terms of this operating period, which has never happened before, but also in terms of decommissioning and how to decommission this reactor and how to have the money for it. Because, in fact, Entergy, whether we like it or not, is between a rock and a hard place. They don't have a rate base, and they don't have the money to clean the site up. And I want to talk about decommissioning itself for a minute, because when I said Yang, we regret it the decommissioning process was because Yankee Atomic engaged, and Connecticut Yankee as well, in a dirty, basically illegal cleanup of the reactor site. And why do I say it was illegal? Because they broke all the rules. Until that time, decommissioning had been classified as a major federal action. Major federal action, what that came down to, they had to submit decommissioning plans that were detailed, where they laid out their commitments could be, Rose at one point was over 300 pages. They had oversight. NRC inspectors had to be on site. In fact, they had more oversight. And the process for citizens or the state to be able to engage in a hearing process in which they could be involved in cross-examination, all of what it takes to actually get to the heart of what's going on had happened. And with Yankee Atomic, that all ended. We actually took them to court. We won a lawsuit against the NRC. They were found to be in violation of the National Environmental Policy Act, the Administrative Procedures Act, and the Atomic Energy Act. But it was a pyrrhic victory, because what did the NRC do after we won? They changed the rules. So what was illegal, they made legal. So nuclear corporations could now strip and ship a reactor basically with a 12-page document. There was no longer an NRC inspector on site. And in fact, the whole hearing process had been compromised and undermined so that citizens or states didn't have the power that they had. So this really makes all of this process a lot harder. And we have had very difficult experiences with the NRC and with corporations in terms of it. There are things that could happen in terms of Vermont Yankee that 
in terms of laying out what would be a reasonable way to proceed that I just want to lay out because it deals with some of the issues. I'm not going to use the terms safe store and decom because those are basically NRC terms mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily have much relevance except the word safe store which has been bandied about as a 60 year process makes it impossible to really talk about anything about safe store that might be even more reasonable in this. So in terms of what CAN believes is possible is we believe it's possible to have a thorough and responsible cleanup of the site. You know, we believe decommissioning can start right away upon closure. It does not need to sit there. But in fact, what has to happen during this period is really important in which Entergy can continue to employ the skilled workforce. First, they should, as Ray talked about, transfer the high level waste into dry cast storage. That is the greatest concern upon closure. They can also commence and need to commence site surveying for the contamination on site. And it's really important that the skilled workforce is used in this process because they know where the leaks are. They know where the accidents took place. They're the ones with the institutional memory to do the right job on this. So we also believe that they can be involved in taking down buildings that are not you know, contaminated, that are non-essential. There is a bunch of work that can go on during this period of time. In fact, it went on at Rancho Seco. They employed the workers. At first, they thought they were going to go into safe store. Then, and because they didn't have enough money in the decommissioning fund, what they found, though, was that you know, roofs were blowing off of buildings and that what made more sense was actually starting the process. What we do believe has to happen and what is really important in this because, you know, on paper everything seems easy and reasonable in a way, you know, mm -hmm. like decommissioning is cleaning up a potato factory. Really complicated and difficult and dangerous job. We believe they have to wait eight years before they start cutting up the internals that are in the reactor. They are the most contaminated and toxic elements that are there. You know, at Yankee Row in Connecticut Yankee doing the cut up of the internals and they were taking out steam generators two years after closure, taking them down our roads, on our railways, but they released hot particles all over the site in the process of doing this work. We got it because we got to see their internal documents on all of this when we sued them. At Connecticut Yankee, they actually closed down decommissioning for a year. You've got to remember there aren't NRC inspectors. If they closed it down for a year because workers went into the transfer canal for the fuel pool and, uh, and got contaminated with alpha particles. They weren't wearing masks. They weren't thinking about it. It was not, they weren't educated to what was going on. But the issue of these hot particles and what takes place during this process is really important. Roe was a 2,000 acre site. It was in the middle of nowhere, where I am, four miles from it, but still in the middle of nowhere. Connecticut Yankee was relatively isolated. But you have to understand, at Vermont Yankee, there is an elementary school across the street. There is an elementary school across the river. This is in a neighborhood. I mean, it's madness that any agency would allow a nuclear power plant to be built in a neighborhood, but they did. And so the issue of doing this in a responsible way, in a way that really takes in and protects not just the workers who have gotten contaminated during decommissioning, but the neighborhood and children is really important in this. So that this is not such an easy process. And I want to raise one other part of this in terms of, you know, not waiting 60 years, but waiting a certain amount of time because a number of the radionuclides that are involved in decommissioning, like cobalt-60 and the tritium, will have reached their half-life or be close to it in 8, 10 years. The Cesium-137 is 30 years, but it limits the amount of waste that has to go somewhere. And I've got to mention this, and it's going to drive you all crazy, but the waste, this waste, most of it except the high-level waste, is going to Andrews County in Texas. 
Now, do you think they want our waste? Do you think they want it? No, they don't. In South Carolina, we, in fact, did caravan of conscience tours down with the waste to alert people to the fact the waste was there. Yankee Atomic was seen as a carpetbagger, that they were making the South into a toilet mm -hmm. for the nuclear industry. So to also slow the process down slows down the amount of waste that has to go to Andrews County. It doesn't eliminate it because Texas is in a compact. It will not stop that from happening. But the truth in nuclear power is that there are only terrible solutions. And what you're trying to find is the best of the worst. And so much of what goes on in terms of dump communities and in terms of reactor communities is that the poor rural people of color and Native American communities are targeted for nuclear contamination. Mm -hmm. And so we are put in this moral dilemma, this incredible conflict in dealing with this really difficult situation. We wanted the waste out right away until we saw where it was going and who was being affected. And it was an intolerable situation to be in, in which I wanted to protect my children. At the same time, I didn't want to contaminate other people and have them suffer. And what the industry, of course, does is attempt to pit dump communities and reactor communities against each other over who will get screwed last in this bad game. So we can't stop the waste from going to Aunt Andrews County, but we can attempt to do it responsibly, and we can attempt to do it in a way which limits the amount of contamination they get. Andrews County, that dump is located on the single source aquifer for the West. The Ogallala. Mm -hmm. Yes, aquifer. So the potential for that to be contaminated and to contaminate the West is there, and it becomes part of our responsibility in this, not just Texas. Not, there is in, uh, I know I'm driving you all crazy, and it's really painful. By the time I finish talking at times, I want to go drink, and I, I can only imagine what you're feeling at this point, but I'm going to finish it, because in terms of Barnwell, South Carolina, there's a single source plume of tritium, a 100-acre plume of tr tritium going to the single source aquifer for that community. Now, it's not all the West. It's just some poor 46% African-American community down in South Carolina. But it has meaning. And the only fight is over how fast it's happening. The EPA is saying it's something like 40 years, I think, at this point. And of course, the company, which has changed hands many times, it was Chem Nuclear, then it was Waste Management Associates, now it's somebody else running it, says it'll be 100 years. And why would it be 100 years? They won't be here. They won't be around. So this is the struggle in all of this. And while we go on in this new experiment at uh, Vermont Yankee, decommissioning a merchant plant that doesn't have enough money, that can't run its reactor safely, and has really questionable street credits on being able to decommission it, the whole world is going to be watching. And we will be watching and hopefully participating. Now, there are certain ways to participate. There are conditions the Public Service Board can put in terms of what happens. There are negotiations going on. I actually think it's good there are negotiations going on between the state and Entergy. There are also the ability to set up a citizen advisory board in which the public participates, the state, and the corporation in terms of what's going on in decommissioning. And I think the legislature can still take action, whether it's in terms of putting a fee on fuel and other inducements to get energy to do the right thing itself, because, you know, this reactor could become like tar baby itself for energy and... Uh, I don't think they'd be happy with that any more than we would. So. Okay, this is. This
On behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for this uh, extraordinary panel. And it... And you're also here, and Vermont Yankee is closing because of the persistent yes. and passionate activism which many of you have participated in over the years. So I think we should also applaud the audience, as well as the speakers. And let me just explain for the next, we have a half hour, uh, we have to close at four. Um, so those who are interested, line up for your questions. Before you start, I just want to point out that there is very good literature from most of the groups um, represented here with the speakers, and some from Nuclear Free Future to look at on your way out. Also, I want to say the sponsors for this event, American, and to thank them, American Friends Service Committee, the Nuclear Free Future, Trap Rock Center for Peace and Justice, Physicians for Social Responsibility, CAN, Citizens Awareness Network, Safe and Green, and the Public Safety Board of uh, Northampton. So with that, we'll start. Um, you have the three by five or four by six cards if you've written a question down. I do want to say if you don't get a, a, an, an opportunity to ask the question because we run out of time, please leave them with me because your questions are important and we'll figure out how they get addressed. Thank you for, for scaring me badly. Um, You're welcome. The, the state of Vermont um, has something to say about reliability and it's up to the NRC to talk about safety. But if there is a stack of maintenance work orders that have not been dealt mm. with, can't we say that makes the plant unreliable and can't we use that to, sh to shut them down sooner? You want well, I, I think certainly the state of Vermont could uh, contend that, it, you know, those outstanding work orders, deferred maintenance, makes the plant unreliable, but how long a fight do you think that one is? Mm. You know, we've seen, you know, simple fights that last three years. And, uh, yeah, they can make that statement. Take us to court, sucker, you know? Thank you. <laughs> I think also there's the potential with, for these issues to be part of negotiations. Any conditions that the Public Service Board puts has the potential to add to negotiations about figuring out what's really important, what Ray has raised in terms of moving the fuel is an essential thing, so that there are ways of negotiating around that to make that a priority for both Entergy and the state, if possible. And it's not clear. Entergy is a very bad apple, and they may not ever come to anything except going to court again, but it's worth trying. Let me comment on that briefly. In, in Vermont, there's, among the many rules there are, there's a rule called 814B, and it says, if you have timely applied for a renewal of a license, you may continue to operate mm -hmm. during the time that that license renewal is uh, under review. And um, Entergy uh, Nuclear came to the Vermont Public Service Board um, for the second time after they won their federal case. Uh, and said, we don't even think we need to be here, and we're going to keep operating no matter what you do. So, there. Mm -hmm. and, and they will. And they have the cooperation of the Vermont Public Service Department, which, in their opinion, said, yes, indeed, they're entitled to operate while this is under review. And that includes appeals. Mm. Mind you, we have only... <laughs> We have only 12 months until it's all moot. So um, the, the best the Public Service Board can do is to grant them their certificate of public good, but with, with conditions, case. and then we argue over whether or not those conditions are enforceable. Um, it's, not a, it's not a quick, easy game. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry to say you scared me so much. I think it's premature to be celebrating. I'm very serious about that. Um, I understand the impossibility of doing anything within a year legally to force the closure, but it may be worth doing if we can afford to just to set a precedent for other plants. There's a hundred more that are going to be closing. 
Um, then I, the other point I have is uh, perhaps we can put some pressure some other way to close it. I mean, is there a possibility, for example, that they're uh, putting too much heat in the river or, mm -hmm. you know, anything we could do to put pressure on them. And the public pressure may just be just as important as the legal argument. And maybe they're looking for a reason to just shut it off quicker than, you know. So um, that's, that's my comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe we can hope some major fails without an accident. Yeah. Pray a lot, right? You Does know, any, the, the, the one, I, I was looking at that question. In the one, in the next 12 months, the Connecticut River is going through the FERC. Right. Which is the Federal Energy Regulatory right. Commission's review of dams on the river. It says in the legislation that nuclear power plants are specifically exempt from, from being, being part of this. But I was thinking some clever people could say there's secondary or tertiary factors that could be looked at in terms of this and the impact on the Connecticut well, River. The department has already said at one point one of its conditions was that Entergy had to stop its thermal pollution of the yeah. river. That's one yeah. of the conditions they set, and it's one of the things that could cause Entergy to close if yeah. it doesn't go to court over it. But if it doesn't go to court, it's a very expensive process yeah. to use the cooling towers yeah. for the year. And I, I, I just, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but I, I am an expert at linking things. Mm. And, that, and this seems to me in one, at one point mm. where some very smart people could begin to put pressure in the short term, particularly because the FERC is ongoing right now. Yeah. So I, I just toss that out yeah. as, as, as one possible idea for you. Deb, just to <coughs> sort of uh, tease apart what you were saying with respect to the Certificate of Public Good that there, within that, is a chance to require, for example, that they cool the water in their right. cooling tower, which would be very expensive because of the right. uh, utility use, before they discharge into the river and cause thermal pollution. Right. Yes. And the studies are in place that have demonstrated that by the Connecticut River Watershed Council. And so this could be so costly that they would close down sooner. Okay. I mean, there have been, I think, in Paul and Ray should may know this better than I. There have been reactors that said they were going to close and they said they would operate for a longer period of time before they closed, but none of them did it, in fact. They all wound up closing relatively fast. The only other reactor at this point is Kiwani out in the Midwest. That's it also a merchant plant in a situation where it couldn't get a long-term power contract. It's financially in bad shape and it's going to close in ostensibly, I think it's six months or a year that Kiwani said it was going to do it. Mm -hmm. So they're similar, but they haven't had anywhere near the attention or the activism or the interventions that have gone on around Vermont Yankee to put mm -hmm. a kind of public pressure on the situation. Mm -hmm. Next question. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this is a question I've had before. I wonder, is it possible to shut the reactor down during the cycle other than just for an emergency? Can they shut it down tomorrow and never run it again? So let's say something happens or we get enough citizen response, which would be wonderful. Um, could Entergy tomorrow shut the reactor down and start proceeding with the whole business? They would yeah. stop making yeah. money, but yeah. technically, mechanically, it could work. Yeah, there's no, absolutely no problem. I mean, are they going to do it? Only if they have to. Yeah. You know, if their condenser totally failed, I'd say, yes, they would. But they'd have to. Yeah. Uh, but short of something major, as long as they're going to continue money. to make money, they're going to continue to operate. Thank you. Thank you all for participating in this important event today. I regret to say I don't think any members of our city council are here, but I think that it's very important that Massachusetts weigh in on this. And we invited uh, Peter Cocott, and he um, isn't here, and Stan Rosenberg said he had a conflict, but 
I am wondering why Massachusetts isn't putting a pressure on Deval Patrick. Where is he on this issue? There are more of us uh, vulnerable to Vermont Yankees uh, damaging the population in Massachusetts than there are in southern Vermont. So that's where I want to put my energy. And I just want to add also that public school was built after the plant was built, developed. And I think it was a, you know, a way that energy or the corporation was trying to say, see how safe this is. I think it's really important to push Patrick on this, but also to support Markey and Sanders in this. We are asking for congressional hearings on the whole issue of why they won't look at the finances. I think the issue of looking at merchant plants and their financial vulnerability at this point, which of course is what a number of groups said when they started, you know, buying up these old rickety plants was going to happen is now here. But I think contacting those representatives is really important. They also need our support to hear that people care about this. I'd, I'd like to endorse your comments and, and <clears throat> also Debbie's. The, the state of Massachusetts is actually a, a leader right. in setting um, residual radiation yeah. uh, level standards. They did it with uh, Fort, is it Fort Devens, is that yes. what it's called? Yes, yes. They did it with that and, and, and set it up so that their strict standards went into effect when the NRC was through. Right. They, they beat the rap on, on preemption. And so the, the state has a good record on that. Uh, um, John uh, Oliver, was it Oliver? Yes. Uh, uh, was just great in terms of responding to his constituents. Um, a lot of good people that have worked with us in Vermont live just over the line in, mm. in Massachusetts, and they need to be involved. And, and um, so I would say that one thing you all can do is to go to your officials, you know, local, county, state, right up the line, and say that they want, you know, people want uh, Massachusetts involved in the Vermont decommissioning, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, at whatever level. Yep. Thank Ray, you, Francis. Ray, just a point of clarification. You said residual standards of contamination. Is it radiation or radiation, Ra radiation. plus other things? No, uh, this was radiation, radiation. standards. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And, and the Massachusetts standards were the ones that were adopted in Maine um, and uh, in Connecticut. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Although in Connecticut, not in statute, but they were applied right. at Connecticut Yankee right. as well. And uh, it's, just, it's just a grand thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your knowledge and your commitment and your interest in, in coming here today and informing us and helping us. Um, I could have something wrong here and stop me along the way, but it's my understanding that those spent fuel rods, have many of them, have been in that pool long enough that they could be put in dry cast storage yeah. right yeah. now. Yeah. So what I mean, I, I understand that I've heard it's a million dollars per dry cast storage, and of course, Entergy uh, doesn't have two pennies. What, what could we do? I, I mean, I can't stand this waiting until 20, you know, the end of 2014 to start this dry cast storage, and of course, we know that's going to be a problem even starting it then. I, I feel that we should be doing it now. And how do we, you know, get that going now? This has nothing to do with closing that plant. This has everything to do with safety, and it has to do with safety of today. And is there, are, do you have any thoughts about how we can push that level? One thing I would suggest to you is to go to the NRC website, uh, www.nrc.gov, real simple. Um, currently, the, there is a rulemaking underway for what they call their waste confidence rule. Right. And in it, they actually compare, uh, favorably compare spent fuel storage and, uh, and dry cask and make um, your sentiments known. Right. Um, and I think the deadline is the 20th, I think. Right. That's what I have in the back of my mind. Uh, of this for, month? Yeah, yeah, for writing. And it's been going on for a while. Right. We've, all, we've all been deeply involved in the fight. Right. And, um, but, you know, people need to weigh in on that 
Um, and it, we met in July and uh, again, again a few weeks ago with the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, of uh, New England Coalition uh, folks, and uh, pleaded with her to uh, make Vermont Yankee a kind of pilot uh, plant mm -hmm. or test case for the new waste confidence rule. What, what applies and what doesn't, how does it work out or not? Um, so, you know, that, that's just our way of kind of like going around the, the, the barn to bring the issue home to, uh, to Vermont Yankee. But, you know, you all, um, I know that you're all good at this. <laughs> you all can badger your local officials and say, you know, we want, we want Massachusetts involved. We want this safer storage. Yeah. But the biggest problem I think we all have is convincing the NRC to admit that continued storage in wet pools is much more dangerous. Mm -hmm. And except for the chairman's statement last week, you're not going to get them there because they're always going to say it's safe both ways. And uh, it's not. Um, right. But to get them to do the reanalysis, I mean, the, the threat of a terrorist attack on any of these plants, especially the BWRs, right. is phenomenal with the wet storage. I mean, they could just rupture that whole pool and, you know, contaminate tens of thousands of square miles. Mm -hmm. But the NRC will never admit that that could have happened. They will. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ray. You understand better than I do. No, no. I just don't want to. I don't want to give up on on the, on the spinelessness of the of the spinelessness of the NRC. Um, you know, they're just like a jellyfish. You poke them one place, and they'll move in another place. And um, they are sensitive to political pressure. They will change the science. They will change the math if they have sufficient political pressure put on them. And, um, and they'll change the policy. So it, it, it depends on all of us to be more annoying than the industry to NRC. Um, my head is full of all this amazing information and uh, ideas of what to do next. I hope that uh, the organizers will put, give us a to-do kind of list, follow-up list. Um, as well, but um, that will be helpful, and we can spread the word to, to other folks that weren't able to come today. Um, what um, about three or four years ago? I remember lobbying at the um, ANA in DC for their lobby days. <coughs> excuse me, about hardened on-site storage, and I haven't heard right. anyone mention that today. Uh, that was mentioned as the. That was our main ask that year in terms of um, the safety. We know it's also very expensive, right. but uh, what are your views on the feasibility of that for the future? Well, Thanks. we would, I mean, the struggle in the notion of hardened storage, at least it, it really bumped up after 9-11 and the vulnerability of nuclear reactors and specifically their fuel pools, which we've been talking about, to acts of malice. So I mean, we had Dr. Gordon Thompson do an analysis of what it would take to harden the site uh, at Vermont Yankee or at Indian Point in terms of the fuel, getting it out of the pool, and having certain conditions, which are double walling, separating the casks by a lot more than they are, and uh, potentially berming them in. I mean, the, one of the struggles with Vermont Yankee is that it is a tiny site. Right. So it, it would not be easy to harden it, although there are ways it can be done. The millstone reactors, in fact, I think um, Duke has done some work. Is it Duke that owns millstones? Who is the? Dominion. 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 I knew it was one of the Ds. Yeah. Yes, and they've done some hardening in terms of casts on that site. So we support it, but in some ways there's this trade-off at this point. The main thing is to get the fuel out of the pool, you see. I mean, we can't even get to the notion of hardening because that will cost, uh, according to Thompson's analysis, somewhere about a third more in terms of each cask. It is essential, but when you have a merchant plant 
without a pot to piss in, then what you just want them to do is get it out of the fuels, uh, get it out of the pool is the first step, so. Let me say this with, in terms of feasibility, because I, I love quoting the industry to itself. Mm -hmm. um, the, the manufacturer of the casks that we're presently using at Vermont Yankee went back to the drawing board about the time that, that uh, this uh, hardened on-site mm -hmm. storage was big, they went back to the drawing board and they redesigned this, the cask that we're using at Vermont Yankee for use underground. Mm. It's, this is the, the um, High Storm 100, and they have now the High Storm 100 U for underground. And uh, they went through with licensing to a point, but when the political pressure dropped mm. off, they pulled that license application, mm. you know, because there wasn't the public interest in it. Uh, it's just it's an illustration of why it's really important to just not to be relentless huh? not to let up on these ideas until you know until it's proven impossible you know you really want to to push it hello um, hello my name is Brianna I'm an intern at American Friends Service Committee Brianna, a little closer and okay. a little louder okay so um I was just wondering um my awareness has kind of um, of nuclear power and the decommissioning process. Um, it's a press, pressing issue, and um, this panel has definitely helped me understand it a lot more. Um, but I was wondering, what um, Paul, like you said, that you know you're old and you're tired. So, and your generation will only be around for so long. So, what will what will happen once your generation is gone? Um, is there like any educational campaigns going out for the younger, <laughs> for the younger, you know, the younger generations, or just um, children in school? Um, and if there's not, like, what advice would you have to get people who are ignorant of these issues to become more aware? I could take that. <laughs> the uh, I'm the academic. That yes. the uh, one of the things we're doing. Just to show you is that uh, we're working now with Clark, UMass and Clark, and we, we would like to do a study of what a post-nuclear power plant community would look like um, over a period from, let's say, next 10 years, next 20 years, and next 50 years, and, and, that, and, and then do some assessment work in terms of whether or not there ever was recovery, whether the storage on site was, was worked very well. And so we're going to be training, we hope, you know, between 10 and 20 students, graduate students, in, in, uh, in having an understanding of what this is. I hope that things like that and I th can, can happen bits and pieces across, across the region because it's not going to go away and it's something you, you do need to keep, keep abreast of. The truth is people act opportunistically, which means when they think they're about to get screwed, they learn a lot. That's and that's always true. It happened for me. So, you know, th that is when it becomes real and immediate for each person. And part of the work is getting people to realize how they're impacted one way or another. It's not necessarily in terms of safety. It may be about economics. It may be about social issues. It's not just about safety or radiation. It's about the drain on the economy. There are all sorts of things, the vulnerability of corporations, the kind of control they exercise. I mean, partly what Entergy said in their lawsuit is that no state should be able to tell a corporation what to do. That was part of their lawsuit. That's quite a statement. That's something worth fighting over. So there are all sorts of issues to tie people in on that go beyond just the issue of radiation, which drives just about everyone to distraction. Can I quickly add? Joanna Macy has a website where she explains her, um, I forget the name of it now, Nuclear Legacy Project right. or something. And she's addressing not only young people today, but hundreds and even thousands of years into the future mm -hmm. and the need for something like a nuclear priesthood. Anyway, she's done a lot of work. There's a lot of written material up there that's really excellent. Joanna Macy. I want to thank you for all the work you're doing. It's fantastic. I noticed that I also want to thank you for being so very practical about it and really seeing that there's a problem and trying to solve it. 
I come here and I feel like we got sold down the river. We got a really bad bill of goods. We're going to be paying for it forever. And, and I know that's not the most constructive way to look at it. At the same time, I do feel like, as you were saying, if I want, this, these are two questions. One, is anybody really doing the math to say, guess what you just paid for energy? You know, just exactly how much you paid. And who called this a profit? Who got to say, OK, we're done. We're just going to claim the profit. And we're going to pass these costs on for generations onto you. And I just wonder if anybody's doing that math so that the numbers are really clear mm -hmm. and appreciable because this has affected everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody in America is going to be paying for this mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. The other, the other uh, question I wanted to ask, and I hope, I'm hoping you can know where those numbers are. The other question I want to ask is, is there actually no criminal, criminal accountability for negligence? And well, you know what they call a person who steals a million dollars? A thief. You know what they call a company that steals one dollar from a million people? A utility. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I figured it was in the dictionary somewhere, yeah. yeah. What about his question about the, the costs map. that end up back on citizens? Any, there is a $50 billion estimate, Hattie, that uh, NRC is paying utility companies that have sued them for having to keep yeah. their waste on site. That's our, that's our taxes, so I know that that we can provide you with that, that that's a piece of it. Because this is all getting paid for out of taxes now, yeah. right? The no, it's coming out of rate pay. Um, the decommissioning fund that exists came from rate payers, came from the money that rate payers contributed in Vermont, Massachusetts, right. Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Maine out of, you know, to the utility when it was owned as utility Vermont Yankee was owned. Once Entergy took over, there's no rate base and there's nobody paying for it at this Very point. Very clever business shenanigans, right? Well, they wanted an open market. Now that they have an open market, they're whining that they don't feel it's fair. It's like, you know, a uh, person who shoots their parents and throws themselves on the mercy of the court for being an orphan. Mm. But it also re worked to reduce accountability at a time after they managed to claim some profits. Well, this is a predicament for the NRC, for these merchant plants. This, there is no easy way through this, and nobody has the answers yet. This has just never happened before. We, we have time for one more question. We have two people here. I'm just going to uh, bring, please take materials from the table. Uh, please sign up to be part of the Nuclear Free Future email list, and you'll get this kind of information. Um, and uh, also, we put this on everybody's uh, seat today. And this was initiated by Stan Rosenberg, and it was signed by Steve Brewer, Steve Kulak, and Paul Mark. We invited all of our uh, area representatives, state representatives and state senators to come, and none, none of them came. And I think that they should be held accountable because they're not really hearing their constituents' concerns. So you really need to write to them. You really need to call them and say, where were you at this uh, conference at you know hearing about decommissioning what is your position are you going to be at the table and I know that um, Ray did fabulous work in Maine I'm sorry you didn't brag sorry Maine <laughs> uh, Ray about that work because that work really did contribute to the way Maine Yankee was shut down with I think it was nine years underfunded uh, under you know what the estimate was and to a greenfield and that had a lot to do with your work up there. And so, sorry you're not more of a bragger, but we can make a difference. And I think we have to let our elected officials know it's not okay that they don't come to this, that they don't reply. This was good that Stan Rosenberg did this, and this, is going, this was going to Vermont. And uh, he now really wants a seat at the table. So everybody needs to get in touch with him to advocate more for that to happen. Thank you, Hattie. Um, well, who is, if there are no rate payers, then where is, whether it's uh, 700 million or whatever the amount, 
where is that yes. money going to come from? I it, don't well, part of it is that it's invested. Entergy has, in fact, a organization, you know, that invests it in the stock market and whatever, in which it gets built up. They, in fact, don't control where it gets invested. And they don't control the fund. They don't get to use it until they do decommissioning. What would happen if they were a utility, that fund would still exist, but there would be rate payers who continued to pay into it. There's no one to pay into it. And the question, which is why the issue of safe store comes up of 60 years, is that because Entergy doesn't have the money that it needs to clean the site up, and if it actually moves the fuel right away into dry cast storage, it will eventually get reimbursed by the federal government for doing that, but it even cuts down the amount of money that's in the decommissioning fund in terms of cleaning it up. So, it so it's like a finite amount. It's a finite, well, it's like building over time. Right, but they're right. talking about it building over a very long time. There is some talk about piercing the corporate veil, but we've looked into how complicated Entergy's corporate veil is, and it's pretty rough. In fact, the Attorney General raised it, of New York, raised it to the NRC as one of the problems in this. They laid out a diagram of what this looks like in terms of trying to get that fiduciary responsibility and their concern that there really isn't any in this, except for this holding company, which doesn't have a lot of money in right. it. It has this fund and it in fact is basically paying out other branches of Entergy's limited liability corporations, paying money to them to manage the reactor and paying money to the corporation under Entergy that sells the power on the open market. It's a Byzantine, well thought out corporation to make it well nigh impossible to pierce their veil easily. Unfortunately, Thank you. Thanks. diabolical. Thank, Thank you for your great work. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to finish. I think we should thank these speakers again for the excellent panel that we've had, excellent. Yeah. And, and they have given us, they are so grounded, they have given us very good suggestions for citizen action uh, as well. A nuclear free future, I think, will try to summarize those and make those available through our listserv, which is a good reason to sign up for it. But thank you again for your time, for missing the Patriots game. <laughs>